should go. <laughs> come on up. I'm going to have my 11-year-old um, daughter come up. And uh, she's going to sing Clean by Natalie Grant. I hope that you're uh, blessed as she does. This last week, I really spent a lot of time in prayer, seeking the Lord. Not that I don't always do that, but in anticipation of Resurrection Sunday, I uh, took some time, prayed, fasted, and really sought the Lord. And I'll be very candid and explain to you why this year was... Um, a little more intense. My sense is, is that, well, let me back up. I, let me tell you what I petitioned the throne concerning. 
I don't want to get up on Resurrection Sunday and just preach a canned sermon and just have it be, you know, kind of same old, same old. I didn't sense that the Lord was going to, for lack of a better way of saying it, let me get away with that. <laughs> that there's no time for that. And so I sought the Lord and he impressed upon my heart something that he's really been ministering to me as of late. I, you say, Pastor, you say that every week. Well, that's because the Lord's been ministering a lot to me <laughs> as of late. And it seems like uh, there's always something that the Lord is trying to speak into my life. And what the Lord really ministered to me is that Resurrection Sunday is a day that those who are distant from the Lord can come back to the Lord. And perhaps more importantly, those who don't know the Lord can come to a saving knowledge of the Lord. And that's what I want to talk about today. It's my belief that in this day and age in which we live, especially here in Hawaii, life is hard. When somebody says to you, hey, how's life treating you? I always like to answer, life is treating me terribly, <laughs> but God is good. Life is hard, but God is good. Life is busy. I don't think that I'm that much different than you, but isn't it true that life seems to be getting busier and even harder and more stressful? And more expensive. <laughs> and it seems to be increasing with that intensity. And what's happened, I believe, is that it has drawn us away from the Lord. The busyness of our lives. And so I'm just going to be very bold and say that for those of us who have maybe become distant from the Lord, I think the, the plea is that today we need to come back to the Lord. And we need to return to our first love. Like the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation. They had done so well. And then as time went on, they became distant from the Lord. And Jesus had John write this letter to them. And it was really a rebuke to them to come back to him. To return to their first love. They hadn't lost their first love. They had left it. That's an important distinction to make. So what I want to do today is have you turn in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 16. And I want to read verses 1 through 14. And uh, if you're able, I ask you to stand. You can follow along as I read. If not, that's all right where you're seated. We'll begin in verse 1, where Mark, by the Holy Spirit, is writing. And he says now, verse 1, when the Sabbath was passed... Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And verse 3, they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, 
They saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified? (laughs) He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. Oh, (laughs) hang on to that. I want to talk about that. That he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So, verse 8. They went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And, verse 11, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it to the rest, but They did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Would you pray with me? Loving Heavenly Father, we're standing here in this beautiful church, and there's an anticipation in our hearts. that you're going to minister to us today on this Resurrection Sunday. That you're going to speak to us in and through your word. And in this time that we have together today in your word. So Lord, would you, as only you can, speak into our lives very clearly if need be, very personally and very powerfully. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much. The reason I chose Mark's gospel account is because, like with many other places in Scripture, there are some very interesting and specific details that are within the text. And such is the case in verse 7, where the women were instructed to tell the disciples and Peter, which if you think about it, is it's almost kind of like <laughs> a diss in a way. It's kind of like when somebody says, uh, gentlemen and JD, as if to imply that I'm not a gentleman. Well, it's like, tell the disciples and Peter. I don't think it was like that. As if to infer that Peter was not one of the disciples. I hope you know that's not the case here. There's a reason that 
we have this detail within the text and within Mark's account. And I want to, for us to focus our attention on the why. Why we have these two words and Peter. When they're told to go and tell the disciples. Why the emphasis on Peter particularly? Why didn't they just say simply go tell the disciples? It's almost as if it's go tell the disciples and make sure to tell Peter. Why? Why Peter in particular? Well, we're going to answer that. But in order to do that, we need to first fill in some of the blanks from Luke's gospel. I'll have you turn to Luke chapter 22. We're going to be there for basically the remainder of our time today. In Luke's gospel, we have kind of the blanks filled in with what happened prior, actually that week prior to the crucifixion and then subsequently the resurrection. And it actually started with what we affectionately refer to as the Last Supper, which we're going to celebrate today as we partake together of the communion at the end of the service, which I'm really looking forward to. Luke writes that as they're celebrating Passover together, Jesus, imagine the scene, they're, they're sitting there reclined at the table. And by the way, the, I'm sorry for, uh, to ruin your you know, Last Supper paintings. They weren't seated at a table. <laughs> they were actually reclined on the floor, as was the custom in that day. And they're seated there. And they have just partaken of the uh, broken bread and the cup. And Jesus turns to Peter and says something to him that is just utterly astonishing. He says to him, uh, Peter, <laughs> uh, Satan has asked for permission for you to sift you as wheat. I want you to uh, follow along as I read verses 31 through 35. <laughs> the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. I can just imagine what Peter's thinking. Wait, <laughs> Satan asked you for permission to sift me? You told him no, right? <laughs> No, I, I gave him permission. You did? Why would you do that? Oh, you'll see. On Thursday nights in the book of Job, we're learning how it is that God will never allow the devil to do anything to us unless it ultimately, in the end, is for our good and for his glory. And that's what's going to happen here, by the way. So Jesus says, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Interesting, not your courage, but your faith. And when you have returned to me, key, strengthen your brethren. Listen to Peter's response. He said to him, Lord, <laughs> I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. You got to love Peter. And then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. Well, shortly after this, Jesus gets up and as was often the case, he goes to the Mount of Olives to pray and the disciples follow him and when they get there Jesus goes off 
by himself to pray. And before he does, he says to the disciples, you pray that you may not enter into temptation. Pray and watch. Pray and watch that you do not enter into temptation. So he goes off to pray. He comes back and he finds them sleeping instead of praying. And he says that you, you couldn't watch just for one hour. You couldn't pray. And as he's speaking, they come and arrest him. When Peter sees that they're arresting Jesus, he takes, this, this is the courage of Peter, which is going to be germane to our understanding of what we're going to see here. He, he, he failed in the area of his greatest strength. Jesus said, I, I prayed that your faith may not fail. His faith is not going to fail. His courage is. And if there was ever a man that was courageous, it was Peter. In that courage, that fearless courage, he takes his sword and he cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant, Malchus. And Jesus heals him, touches the ear, heals his ear. And I can, I can sort of picture the scene and I can sort of imagine Peter just being mortified because he totally missed what was happening there. Well, in verse 54, Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, let's pick it up. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But, and I want you to pay particular attention to what it says here. It says, Peter followed at a distance. Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And verse 56, a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, you also are of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, that must have been a long hour for Peter. Another confidently affirmed, saying, surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, verse 60, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, imagine this. The rooster crowed. And verse 61 I can't even begin to imagine. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. I wonder what kind of a look he gave him. I wonder if Peter could even look him in the eyes. Never imagine that the look that Jesus gave him was one of anger. One of disappointment? No. Certainly it was not a look of, I told you so, Peter. No. 
I think that when he turned and looked at Peter, he had a look of such love and compassion and kindness and mercy and grace. Oh, Peter, Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So, verse 62, Peter went out and wept bitterly. Woven into the fabric of Luke's account, we have our answer to the aforementioned question of why they're told to make sure that they not only tell the disciples, but they make sure specifically that they tell Peter. Peter is absolutely devastated. He has done that which he vowed never to do. That which he, in his wildest imagination, never thought he would do. He's done the unthinkable. He was ashamed of Jesus. He was ashamed to be associated with this man that was being taken to the cross to be crucified. He's not only ashamed of Jesus, he has just denied Jesus three times. It seems that Satan has succeeded in sifting him as wheat. And now Peter, he's got to be thinking to himself, I have totally blown it. His whole world has come crashing down now. He's denied Jesus whom he loves so much. I think of Peter's personality. And it explains a lot, you know, the, the outbursts. I, I see Peter as being a very emotional guy. I see him as being a very passionate guy, certainly a very courageous guy. Peter's the kind of guy that you want to have as a friend. I just kind of like his personality. I can't wait to meet him in heaven. I feel bad for him. I think he gets a lot of bad press, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> but it's over as far as he's concerned now. He has denied his Lord. Surely God is through with him. By the way, <laughs> I know that's what he's thinking. Not because I can read his mind, but because he goes back to his fishing business. That's it. He's done. It's over. But God. But God is not through with Peter. What Peter doesn't yet know, what he can't yet know, is that Jesus has a plan for him. Not to harm him, but to prosper and bless and restore him and give him a future and a hope. Do you think that Jesus is angry with Peter? If you do, please know that he is absolutely not angry with Peter. He loves Peter so much. And not only does he restore Peter, and we know that he restores Peter three times, once for each time, that Peter denied him. Three times he restores him. 
Do you love me, Peter? Yes. The third time he uses the word in the Greek, agape, do, do you agape me, Peter? And Peter broke down and cried again <laughs> because he realized that he was being restored and how much Jesus really loved him. So much so. And this, to me, how do I say this? It, it just, it gets me, especially as a pastor and a preacher of God's word. In, in the book of Acts chapter 2, I love this. God chooses and uses Peter to be the first one to preach the gospel. I wouldn't have done that. I'd have said, no, no, I didn't. he needs more time. I'm not going to have him come speak at my conference. He just denied the Lord three times. What are you talking about? Are you kidding me? No. He's the first one. <laughs> that gives guys like me hope. <laughs> God can take and he chooses and uses the foolish to confound the wise. He uses a Peter to preach the gospel in all of its power. And all of these people get saved through this flawed vessel, this denier of Jesus Christ. Here's where I'm going with this. We're all like Peter, aren't we? Aren't we just as prone to become distant from the Lord? You say, well, hey, listen, I, with all due respect, Pastor, I've never denied the Lord. Well, wait, 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 wait. What about those times when you were ashamed to let someone know that you were a Christian? You were embarrassed. What about that? What about that opportunity that the Lord presented you to share the gospel and you cowered and faltered and failed because you're ashamed of the gospel. You're ashamed, ashamed to be associated with Jesus because of what it might cost. I find it interesting and it's really subtle. Satan is so subtle he got to Peter, he sifted Peter, but it didn't just happen instantaneously. It was a, sifting is a process. There was just this, this process of time where slowly and gradually you find Peter more comfortable sitting amongst the world And the, the fire of the world. And, and the details of how that when they arrested Jesus, he, it says, and, and Peter. There's those two words again. And Peter <laughs> followed from afar off. He was kind of at a distance from the Lord now. To me, and this is something the Lord just kind of <sighs> struck me with, is that it started with, of all things, prayer. This is where it starts. If Satan can get us to stop praying, he's got us. 
You know why? Because that's the deciding factor. We're sleeping instead of praying. We're not watching and praying. He sort of lullabies us into a spiritual slumber and drowsiness. He, he doesn't want us praying. That's why it is, by the way, when you set your foot to pray, that all of a sudden a, a drowsiness comes over your eyes, a heaviness comes on your eyes. And your mind begins to wander. And the phone begins to ring. And then somebody's at the door. And oh, I've got an email. Or somebody's comment. Or how about that text? He will do everything and stop at nothing to keep us from praying. And then once he gets us to stop praying. Then the distancing begins. And then it's not long before in that distance from the Lord we find ourselves more comfortable with the world. More comfortable in worldly environments. And then it's not long before we're denying the Lord. That's the tactic. That's the strategy. You know, before we come to Christ, Satan will do everything he can to keep us from coming to Christ. But when we come to Jesus Christ and a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, then he, he changes strategies. He regroups. And now... His whole strategy is to get us away from the Lord, distant from the Lord. And it's very subtle, the ways that he does it. He busies us with the cares and the affairs of this life. I suppose it should come as no surprise that when Peter sees Jesus being arrested, he reacts by fighting a spiritual battle with carnal weapons. You want to know why? He's carnal. You know what I mean by carnal? He's in the flesh. That's what carnal means. It means flesh. Next time you go buy a can of chili con carne, you're buying chili with flesh, with meat. That's what it, sorry if I ruined your appetite for those. That. <laughs> There's a carnality that sets in, a worldliness that sets in. And here's what happens. In his textbook, <laughs> Absent prayer, we operate and we live our Christian lives in the energy of the flesh because we're carnal Christians, we're worldly Christians. We've left our first love. We're not close to the Lord. It's really interesting to me, and it explains to me why it is that Peter, imagine, I mean, he rebukes the Lord. How arrogant is that? How self, self-confident is that? I won't deny you, Lord. I will die for you, Lord. Peter is so full of himself. It's called pride. And doesn't pride always without exception lead to the fall? A haughty spirit, a fall, pride to destruction. The, the, 
That's what I mean by textbook. You can write the next chapter. You can write the next chapter in Peter's life. You can write the next chapter in your life and in my life. Because when we're distant from the Lord, it's all about self. When we're close to the Lord, we die to self. And Jesus said, if you really want to be my disciple and you want to follow me, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to pick up your cross and deny yourself, not me, (laughs) deny yourself and follow me. If you want to be my disciple, you have to die to yourself. Bear with me, please. I have to... I have to be very uh, transparent because I'm just as prone as you are. Oh, but you're the pastor. I know. (laughs) Don't think for a second that Satan hasn't asked for permission to sift me as wheat. And don't look at me all confident and everything. He's asked for permission for you too. in my own life. This sobers me. Because I love the Lord like Peter loved the Lord. I was loyal. I, I, I'm just as devoted to you, Lord. But this could have been me. This could have been you. Here's the good news. When, not if, we drift away, he's waiting with open arms for us to come back. One of the most powerful and emotional parables that Jesus ever taught was the parable of, we refer to it as the prodigal son. You have to understand something about this parable. And it's not so easily understood, especially in our culture in the United States of America. In my culture in the Middle East, you you won't miss it. The father is waiting with anticipation for his prodigal son to return. And when he sees his son from afar, from a distance coming back he runs to him he runs to him men in that culture to this day they don't do that that would be the ultimate humiliation that is beneath the father to do He gathers his robe so he won't trip over it to run to his son returning to him. Can you imagine? He's waiting with open arms. He'll run to you to welcome you back. Maybe that's you here today. You've drifted away. Come back. Come back. Come back home to him. I mean, let's be honest. 
How's it working out for you anyway? Out there. No, I'm, I'm asking, how, how's it working for you? Do you miss him? Do you miss that intimacy that you once had with him? That closeness? Do you have fond memories of what it was like when you were so close with him and he with you? You drew near to him, he drew near to you in return. It was a love that there are no words in the English language to describe. Don't you miss that? He does. He misses you. And he wants you to come back. I'm only going to take it a step further and suggest that he's orchestrated the circumstances in your life to bring you back to that place. And maybe for you, it's not returning to the Lord. Maybe for someone here today, it's turning to the Lord for the first time. And that's why you're here, by the way. Or that's why you're watching this video. You have no idea how you got this video up on your computer screen. I know how that <laughs> you got this video on your screen. Think about this. Could it be that the Lord has arranged, even choreographed the steps of your life heretofore to bring you to this place today where you've come to the end of yourself? You're so empty. You're so unfulfilled. You're so discouraged. And you're at the end. Truth be known, you might even be hanging on by a thread. But God. But God is waiting with open arms, longing for you to come to him. He loves you. He's not angry with you. He took all of his anger, all of his wrath, and he put it on his only begotten son in yours and my stead. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish in hell for all eternity. I, uh, I just thought of this. I, I have to say it now because I just said that. So, doubtless you also heard that Pope Francis said that there's no such thing as hell. What did Jesus come for then? What is he saving us from then? I'm going to tell you, and you'll forgive the bluntness with which I say this, but hell is forever. And we're all going to spend eternity someplace. It's either, either going to be in heaven or in hell for all eternity. If there's no hell, there's no heaven. And vice versa. And here's another thing, and very important, please listen. God never sends anybody to hell. He did not create hell for man. He created eternity in heaven with him for man. It's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why he sent Jesus Christ, to pay in full for the sins of all mankind, so that we could be saved from hell for all eternity and be with him in heaven for all eternity. That's why he came. That's why he died. That's why he was buried. And that's why he rose again. And that's the gospel. That's the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. 
The bad news is, is that we were all born sinners. The good news is, is that when we're born again of the Spirit of God, that sin is paid for and we're saved for all eternity. I want to share with you the gospel, what the gospel is. The word gospel simply means good news. Your debt has been paid. You're free. That's what the word gospel means. The Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church in chapter 15, his first epistle, verses 1 through 4, said this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. And here's the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. Now what are you going to do about it? How are you going to respond to this good news? I want to share with you by way of what's known as, very simply, the ABCs of salvation. Simply put, this is how to be saved. Let me just share quickly, even parenthetically. Nine months, I see it almost as the gestation period before I was born again. Nine months before I was born again. I found a gospel tract in a public restroom sitting there just for me. And the title of the gospel tract was How to Be Saved. And so I read it. I kept it. And that's when the seed had met with the fertility of my heart to borrow a reproductive metaphor. And it began to grow. And then I was born again. Nine months later. And this is what I want to share with you. How to be saved. The ABCs of salvation. The A is for admit that you're a sinner. Acknowledge your sin before a righteous God that you've fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 says there is no one righteous, not even one Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Again, we've all been born sinners. And this is why we must be born again to see and enter the kingdom of heaven. Romans 6 verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. The death penalty. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the A. Here's the B. The B is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. This is Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if you believe in your heart, that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. By the way, there's only one tomb that you can go to in the entire world that is empty, and it is the tomb of Jesus the Christ. And for those of you who have been with us to Israel, we've been in that tomb. For many, it's the highlight of the entire trip. There are no words again in the English language, as faulty as it is, to describe what it's like to walk into a tomb, which, by the way, forensically, 
They have never been able to find any evidence of any human decomposition in that tomb. You can go to Buddha's tomb. I don't want to. You can go to Muhammad's tomb. I really don't want to. And they're there. You go to the tomb of Jesus the Christ, he's not there, for he has risen. That's the B. Here's the C. It's for call upon the name of the Lord, or if you prefer, confess with your mouth. This is what Romans 10, 9 and 10 also says, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And then lastly, Romans 10, 13 says, all, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Why don't you stand? I want to have the worship team at this time come up. I want for our communion celebration on this resurrection celebration to be an opportunity for all of us. And God knows our hearts. For all of us, to do some business with the Lord. You'll forgive the crass way that I say that, but some of us need to do some business with the Lord. I don't want to Well, let me say it this way. I I do want to give the Holy Spirit the elbow room to do what I believe he wants to do in our midst today. And I make no assumptions. The Lord knows your heart. I only see your outward appearance. And oh, by the way, you all look marvelous today. But the Lord knows your heart. And maybe you've wandered. And maybe today He's saying to you, come back. Come back. Maybe today for someone here, it's not come back, it's come. Come. Today's the day. Today's the day. Today is the day of salvation. And I cannot think of a better day than on Resurrection Sunday. And I, I'm going to say one, one last thing and then we'll have you come up and get the elements and then take them to your seat as the worship team leads us in song. And then wait. The, the, the elements are prepackaged for sanitary reasons. Uh, so just take them back to your seat and wait to partake uh, together. But I'm going to ask you, uh, and this is very important, please just give me one more uh, minute here. If you've never called upon the name of the Lord and you're not going to make that decision, by the way, the most important decision you will ever make in your life for eternal life. If you're not going to make that decision today, then I would just kindly ask that you not partake with us. Because partaking together of the Lord's table is for believers to celebrate and commemorate that which he did for us in dying for us and paying in full for us for all of our sins. Better, if you've never called upon the name of the Lord, why don't you do that today, before, and then partake with us as we celebrate the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much. (sighs) 
Lord, I would ask that nobody look at their watches, think about what they're going to do after. That if someone needs to leave, that they would leave at this time so that we can have this time, this intimacy with you, Lord. Lord, I don't want to embarrass anybody. I don't want to make any kind of a scene or anything. But Lord, I do want to give you the opportunity by the Holy Spirit as only you can to really do a work in this remaining time that we have together as we partake together. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you go ahead and come on up. And there's uh, two tables in the front, one in the back. What can take a dying man? Raise him up to life again. What can heal a wounded soul? What can make
If you're still in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, I want to draw your attention to verses 14 through 20. This is where we have the account of the Last Supper, where Luke, by the Spirit, writes, When the hour had come, he, speaking of Jesus, sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He knows he's about to go to the cross. It's just a matter of now hours, really. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you take the packaging and peel back the top part, you'll find the bread there. Just take it out and hold on to it for a moment. can't even begin to express just how what's the word I'm looking for There's no, there are no words we're going to partake together of the communion on resurrection Sunday wow I mean, it's the only word I can think of is wow this is what it's all about. We hold in our hand a symbol of the body of Jesus Christ that was broken. Not the bones, the body. And Jesus there at that Passover celebration with the disciples takes this bread, this unleavened bread. It could not have leaven in it. Leaven is the yeast a type or a picture of sin. No, he was without sin. So the bread had to be without leaven. Unleavened bread. And in that culture to this day, they, they eat from the same piece of bread because the thought is, is that that bread that's in you is the same bread that's in me. It's a common union. Common union. In my Middle Eastern culture, uh, the, we eat with our hands. I don't do that here, especially at the potluck after. It's not appropriate. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, even with the rice, you would just take it and put it in your hands and eat. And they would dip their, their, all of their hands in the same rice and eat from the same. It didn't matter because we're just one. We're all one. And I think a, a lot of times in the... In, our culture, we really miss the intimacy of what the communion really represents. We're becoming one with him. And so as we partake together of the bread, I just want to again mention that this would be a magnificent time for you if you've never called upon the name of the Lord. To do so today. There's nothing fancy about the prayer. There's no magical repeat after me prayer. Nothing wrong with that. The Lord knows you. When I, when I prayed to receive Christ and I called upon the name of the Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm not a proud of this. I'm actually quite ashamed of this. I was very intoxicated. I was very high. And my prayer was... Basically, I slurred my, my prayer. I, I call out the name of the Lord. That's how I got saved. And the Lord heard. And I was born again. And I woke up the next morning, and I was a new creation in Christ, and old things had passed away. 
all because I had called upon the name of the Lord and I was saved. That was almost 36 years ago. Actually, it was over 36 years ago now. So I implore you today, if you've never called upon the name of the Lord, to do so as we partake together. Would you partake with me? Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving us this to do in remembrance of you and what you did for us. Your body broken, your death on the cross, your burial in the tomb, and your resurrection from the grave three days later. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much. Luke goes on to write and says, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. If you take the rest of the packaging and peel it back, you'll find the cup. And again, just hold on to it for a moment. When we come to this portion of the communion table, I always... Ah, struggle is probably not the right word, but it's really hard to adequately articulate and communicate the importance of the symbolism of that which we hold in our hands. This is a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, stay with me before we partake together. The Bible says that there's no remission, removing of sin without the shedding of blood. This is the shed blood of Jesus Christ, a symbol that we hold in our hands that removes all of our sin, every sin we've ever committed, every sin that we're even now committing, I don't know how you could be sinning uh, right now, but you know, and every sin that we have yet to commit, this side of heaven, prior to the rapture, it is removed, God through the prophet Isaiah declares, as far as the east is from the west. It's not just covered. See, in the old covenant, it was kufar, covered. Covered. No, it's not covered. It's removed. It's gone. As far as the east is from the west. And, and, remembered no more. That's how powerful the blood of Jesus Christ is. And that's why, why it is that it's so hard to adequately express and communicate just how powerful this is. Every sin. One said it this way. Our greatest need was his greatest deed. And his greatest deed was to come of his own volition, willingly, go to the cross, die, shed his blood, was buried for three days, and then rose again for us. That's what we're celebrating here today. Would you partake with me? And once you do, please stand. Father in heaven, we cannot possibly thank you enough for loving us so much that you would send your only begotten son to die for us. That whosoever amongst us would believe would be saved. 
Lord, thank you for the free gift of eternal life. Thank you that we're saved by grace through faith, that it's not of ourselves, lest any of us should boast. Thank you that it's a gift we receive freely. It costs you everything. But it's made available to us for the receiving. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here today that has called upon you, that they would come up and just let us know afterwards so that we can rejoice with them. Because we know that the angels in heaven are rejoicing. And so we want to rejoice as well. Lord, thank you. Thank you for defeating death. <laughs> thank you that death no longer has its sting. Thank you that that trumpet's going to sound soon, very soon. And the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And we who are alive and remain are going to be caught up to be with you forever. And Lord, we too cannot wait until this that we've just done is ultimately fulfilled in your kingdom at the wedding feast of the Lamb. Maranatha. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And God bless you.